Death. When you think of it, you may picture the classic character of Death as the Grim Reaper, walking slowly with his hidden scythe. Or you may envision Death in reality, as a loved family member being laid to rest after last days. No matter how you look at it, it is going to happen to every single one of you. We are all going to die. The question I have for you is would you rather die in a place of suffering or with a sense of dignity? My name is Harry Oak Screpler. Today, I want to talk to you about death and your notions surrounding the culture of death. Specifically, death with dignity. But we'll get to that in a minute. With a raise of hands, has anybody heard of that term, death with dignity? Yeah, yeah, just now. <laughs> <laughs> death is taboo, especially in Western culture. The term taboo, by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary's definition, is something that is banned on grounds of morality or taste. Why is that? Why is something that is completely natural and happens to every living thing such a controversial subject that it is banned on matters of morality and taste? Other common subjects that are considered taboo are politics and religion. Both of those things can be very charged topics, but I wouldn't consider either of them immoral or distasteful to the point they should be banned. Those two topics are both generally avoided in civil discourse, not because they're repulsive or profane, but because people often have very strong emotions about them. The emotional impact of death cannot be understated. Someone who understood the, the uh, impacts of death was Felipe, Felipe Aries, who is a French medievalist that changed Western culture's attitude towards death. In 1982, he argued in his book, The Hour of Our Death, Death is inevitably problematic. Along with sex, it is one of the major ways in which nature threatens culture. Death must therefore be tamed, which societies traditionally do through religion and through ritual. But over the past two centuries, individualism, romanticism, and secularism have undermined the rituals, and the modern individual is left naked before death's obscenity. He spoke of this on the grounds that death was only a social construct as it is a completely and utterly natural epidemic that the people and the people's culture itself is afraid of. Western culture is not only afraid of natural death, but death as a whole idea. Our culture is afraid of suicide in particular. The fear of suicide, but also the cultural interest in it, derives from the fact that it is taboo, that it's not supposed to be spoken of. This struck me as very odd, considering other cultures, specifically in Japan, um, death, suicide is considered an honorable act, primarily during military service. It is used to avoid dishonoring others. An example of Japanese honorable suicide is seppuku. Seppuku is the act of disemboweling yourself with a short blade, which I may add seems to be incredibly painful. <laughs> It has been used instead of surrendering to your enemy or in protest of the government up until most commonly during World War II. Another form of Japanese honorable suicide was kamikaze, which was Japanese fighter planes flying into enemy ships during the Second World War. According to an article by the Japan Times, about 4,000 kamikaze pilots died. Ironically, the father of kamikaze, Admiral Takehiro Onishi, actually committed ritual seppuku after the unconditional surrender of Japan in 1945. When he died, he apologized to the pilots he sent to their deaths. Death is so often glorified and romanticized, perhaps because of the mystery behind it, the fact that no one truly knows what happens when you die. Not all suicide is in an honorable fashion, though. Yes, it is sometimes considered selfish. Yes, people often get led to suicide because they believe they are a burden to their loved ones. But I don't believe it's an unreasonable request to die if you are suffering from an illness or a disease. That's at the core values of the Death with Dignity movement. Why would you take away someone's choice about their death if you know full well they are suffering? I have a question for all of you. Would you rather die in a place of suffering or with a sense of dignity? Physician-assisted suicide has been a topic of growing focus, especially among progressive political groups. But before any interest during any modern era, there were ethics and guidelines surrounding the issue dating back to the height of Greek civilization in the 4th century BCE. 
Hippocrates, who is often considered the father of Western medicine, wrote the Hippocratic Oath, which is still in practice as the code of ethics for modern physicians today. According to Ian Dowbiggin in his book, A Merciful End, The Euthanasia Movement in Modern America, in this ancient Greco-Roman culture, active euthanasia, which means that the doctor was the one who actually ended your life, was widely supported. And the culture around suicide was fairly tolerant. They actively preferred voluntary death instead of prolonged suffering. This is in contrast to Hippocrates' teachings, which strictly forbade the use of active euthanasia. This was before the coming of Christ and the rise of Christianity in the Western world. According to Michael Manning in his 1998 book, Euthanasia and Physician-Assisted Suicide, Killing or Caring, in the 12th to 15th centuries, from the High Middle Ages to the Early Renaissance, Christianity really enforced the doctrines of Hippocrates and his oath. Especially in the 13th century, both Christian and Jewish scholars believe that suicide and euthanasia were inconsistent with the human good and an individual's commitment to God. They believe that euthanasia violated God's authority over life. This position prevailed throughout the Middle Ages into the Renaissance and Reformation periods. Since then, that belief has held strong in the West. Ian Dowbiggin writes in his book that the next big event that changed people's mindset about euthanasia and assisted suicide was the Holocaust. The news of the Nazis' euthanization of people with disabilities, believing they were a burden on society, made its way back to the United States. Here it damaged the whole death with dignity movement because people thought that was what people were advocating and fighting for here. This idea of euthanasia has held strong here ever since, giving people preconceived notions of what the death with dignity movement is fighting for now. Prior to the Holocaust, the American public was very open to the idea of assisted death, especially in the early 1900s, as physicians moved to modern, more modern medical practices and the principles of medicine-controlled universities. And the fight over euthanasia moved on to the main stage of politics. Michael Manning writes that even then, the general consensus of physicians agreed with Hippocrates' teachings, and killing people, even to end their suffering, was still considered an act against God. The idea of physician-assisted suicide and suicide in general being taboo is reinforced by the fact that I contacted five churches, mosques, and synagogues with requests for interviews. Three responded back to my list of questions, which include questions like, how do you counsel people that don't have long to live? Of those three, only one responded to say they could not participate in my research, while the other two did not respond at all. The general consensus that physicians and holy men have is reaffirmed by the Declaration on Euthanasia issued by Pope John Paul II on May 5, 1980. He stated in his declaration, the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council solemnly reaffirmed the lofty dignity of the human person, and in a special way, his or her right to life. The Council therefore condemns crimes against life, such as any type of murder, genocide, uh, abortion, euthanasia, or willful suicide. The focus on euthanasia in this quote was regarding mercy killings, such as physicians willingly executing their patients via lethal injection uh, as if it were the death penalty. This is different from the type of physician-assisted suicide, culturally known as death with dignity we have now. However, the Catechism, which is the principles of the Catholic Church, teaches that suicide goes into a gray area when the patient has a grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture. So in this context, the Catholic Church admits that the act of suicide when it comes to dying patients removes their responsibility to life. The type of euthanasia the Pope spoke of is not what the United States legalizes now. <coughs> Death with dignity now is a prescribed medi medication in a pill or liquid form, and usually requires two diagnoses of, from different physicians of six months or left to live. This is a self-administered method, as opposed to active euthanasia, which a physician performs. Other countries employ other strategies, such as active injection of a drug intravenously, but they also employ the common self-administered method. Now, the modern physician's struggle with death with dignity is that when they take the Hippocratic Oath, they swear to neither give a deadly drug to anybody who has asked for it, 
nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. This oath they take is binding, but there are no clear consequences if you violate it, except what Jonathan Groner writes in his 2008 paper, The Hippocratic Paradox. Medical malpractice, uh, medical malpractice policies cover most of the Hippocratic Oath, which includes killing your patient. The act of killing your patient is incredibly taboo, as it turns out. It completely contradicts many physicians' belief of their occupation, which, which is to save people, not end their lives, despite how much they are suffering. Modern physicians are fighting to balance their patient's suffering with the ethics that they live by. This is an incredibly difficult thing to do. According to a position paper published by the Annals of Internal, Internal Medicine entitled Ethics and the Legalization of Physician Assisted Suicide, the American College of Physicians states their belief that death with dignity undermines the patient-physician relationship, which is built on trust. The ACP also believes that core principles in patient-centered treatment are at stake, including ethics, clinical practice, and policy. For those reasons and more, the ACP does not recommend the legalization of death with dignity. They would rather focus on improving palliative and hospice systems already in place and improve end-of-life care. But that doesn't answer my question to you. Would, you. would you rather die in a place of suffering or with a sense of dignity? These opinions by the ACP haven't stopped different states in the United States and different countries across the world from legalizing either active euthanasia or self-administered death with dignity. The first state in the, United, in the US that legalized assisted suicide was Oregon in 1994. At this point, the only places on earth to have legalized it were the Netherlands and Switzerland. Since then, the legislative districts of Washington, California, Vermont, Colorado, Montana, Washington, D.C., and Hawaii, Hawaii and most recently New Jersey, have all legalized the practice. The large wave of states who have legalized it in the past few years is in line with a poll by Gallup in 2018, showing that a solid majority of Americans are in favor of laws that legalize death with dignity at 72%. As a part of my research, I watched a documentary that was released in 2011 called How to Die in Oregon. This documentary moved the topic from the political and ethical, ethical discussion of death with dignity to have a more personal touch with me. The documentary covered multiple people during their journey to find a death with dignity. One of the patients the documentary focused on was Cody Curtis, a woman from Portland who had a mass the size of a grapefruit in her liver. She spoke of how much pain she was in on a daily basis. Two or three extra months to live only meant more procedures, more pain on herself and her family, and more monetary cost. She summarized the entire movement when she said, if I had an option, to, if I, had an option I would prefer not to die, thank you very much. But given that I am going to die, would an extra three months of fluid leaking through my pores sound that great? Well, no. Rather go when I'm still feeling okay and when I can still communicate with my family. She used her right as a human and a citizen of Oregon to end her life using her death with dignity option. She wondered if this is a cowardly way out, but is it really cowardice to want to end your life to end you and your family suffering? I chose this topic for my TED talk because I didn't understand why physicians and politicians have a moral obligation to protect people from their own deaths. I felt, and still feel, that if someone is suffering, they in fact have a moral obligation to end that suffering, rather than let it be prolonged through medication that makes you groggy, treatments that empty your wallets, and unmeasurable amounts of emotional burden. It's okay if you aren't part of that 72% of Americans. Not everyone may agree with me. What I want to leave you with today is an opportunity to challenge yourself to form your own opinion about this topic. I want you to put yourself in, that, in the position of being on that deathbed and hearing that it isn't possible for, for you to end your suffering, even if you've come to terms with death. Then I want you to think about these questions. Do you think you have the right to judge if a person should be able to die? What is your reason? Why do you get to decide how a person lives their final moments? Thank you.